Hello. Hey. <laughs> I'm Jane. I'm Ella. And I'm Ming. And today we're presenting a, the case of a 58-year-old woman with a skin ulcer, fever, and lymphadenopathy. So our patient noticed symptoms eight days before admission, which were pimple-like lesions on her forehead that increased in size until they became blisters, and it ulcerated with dark fluid and swelling around the region. And five days before admission, she also started feeling high temperatures over 40 degrees Celsius, chills, myalgia, and malaise. And myalgia is just muscle pain, and malaise is the overall feeling of weakness. And these symptoms made it difficult for her to walk and stand, so she had to go to the emergency room. And further into development, she also had cervical lymphadenopathy, as can be seen by the CT scans here. And these are, and as you can see, there are enlarged lymph nodes in the left postauricular region, the mandibular region, and the left anterior and posterior cervical chains, and the supraclavicular region. And when she was finally admitted, her skin ulcer had become like black with more swelling and redness around the lesion and a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius. And she also, as you can see, the lymph node has hardened on the left cervical side. And she also had a systolic murmur. However, she was in no distress and there were nothing else wrong they could find with her with all the blood tests. Before she got this illness, she had a monogamous life with her husband in the wooded area in coastal New England, and she had frequent exposure to the outdoor environment and the pet dog. So she took hikes and walks along parks and kayaks. She also had frequent exposure to skunks, rabbits, and other wildlife. And other than that, she, only, she took a trip to Southern California for a hike of several months before her illness and she does not smoke or use illicit drugs. And her only medication were acetaminophen and clindamycin. And her only other medical history was a C-section. So the medical examiner used a differential diagnosis approach, which it consisted of a fast thinking diagnosis, which was more intuitive and based on pattern recognition, and a slow thinking diagnosis, which was more reflective and deliberate with all the details in it, which overall would lead to a final diagnosis However, in this case, the medical examiners indicated that there was a criteria for slow di thinking diagnosis, which consisted of whether if this was a rare diagnosis, if there were features that like, didn't go well with the favorite diagnosis, and whether the clinical course matched or not. So in terms of the fast thinking process, they immediately assumed it was ulceral glandular tularemia because the patient lived in the forested area of New England. The patient had possible exposure to animal vectors. The patient had ulcerated skin lesions, lymphadenopathy, and a fever. But there were things that didn't make sense, which made them revert to the slow thinking process, such as a heart murmur and glomerulonephritis. And glomerulonephritis is the swelling. Did I swell? Glomerulonephritis is the swelling of the glomerulus and the nephrons, which can be a precursor to kidney failure. And then there was also unconfirmed endocarditis, which could be indicator for pneumatic um, tularemia, which is a more severe case of tularemia. And so all these things just didn't match with ulcerative glandular tularemia. So this is a more detailed list of all the features that are good for and against ulcerative glandular tularemia. I kind of went over the clinical features of it, but in terms of epidemiological features, it was the right time of the year, and again, the patient had many chances to be to be exposed to the animal vectors and but things that went against it in terms of epidemiological features were like it was the ulcerative glandular tularemia is more endemic in south central u.s and again it was so rare that they didn't really want to jump on the wagon on this one so what could explain the skin ulcerated skin lesions and the lymphadenopathy first thing that could explain it was the bubonic plague but that obviously was not it because one, the patient traveled months before the symptoms occurred to Southern California. And then the patient also had no septic shock. And septic shock occurs when the, if you have the bubonic plague, you have to go through an incubation period within that certain time. And if you don't go through that certain time, 
we get septic shock, which is hard and mixed because you get a rapid decrease in blood pressure, which results in poor oxygen perfusion to very vital organs. So another thing they considered was Crickettio's pox, which has a pox-like lesion with a central scar and papulovesicular rash on the appendages. But that wasn't the case in the, for the patient because the patient had no rash and the patient did not live in an urban area where this was endemic. And then another thing they considered was cutaneous anthrax, which is associated with bioterrorism. They immediately ruled this out because the patient did not go anywhere near reported bioterrorism ter activity, nor did the patient tra internationally travel or have exposure to products that where the disease was endemic, such as Africa, Pakistan, or Iraq. So after doing all the cell, diagnose, cell thinking diagnosis, they for, to have a more confirmative diagnosis, they did the serological test. And the serologic diagnosis for tularemia requires that the specific antibodies of ulcerbender tularemia, which is Francisella tularensis, be present in the patient with a titer higher than 1 to 80, or that the concentration of the antibodies increase in four time, by four times over 14 days. And in our patients, you're supposed to see in that table, <laughs> you're supposed to see, see that in the first few days, she had showed negative results for these antibodies, but after four weeks, she had a 1 to 640 titer, which is a very high increase and still a very high number. So they could conclusively say that this was ulcerobandular tularemia. All right, so let's start talking about some drugs. So um, this patient was given acetaminophen um, right when she was admitted to the hospital um, for inflammation because she was presented with some fever um, and some swelling in that ulcer on her forehead. So acetaminophen is for inflammation. She was first given that and then um, she was sent home after that visit. A few days later, her symptoms did not improve um, from the acetaminophen, so she came back to the emergency room, um, and the um, healthcare professionals decided that she has an infection. And so they weren't quite sure um, which infection it was, which bacteria, so they just gave her uh, streptomycin intramuscularly and a three-day supply combination of streptomycin and vancomycin in her hospital stay. Um, just to target and kill basically any bacteria possible that could be causing this infection. Um, as mentioned before, later the healthcare professionals through the um, serological tests were able to find out um, that the culprit was F. tularensis, so they um, changed the treatment a little bit to ciprofloxacin, um, which is a targeted um, antibiotic for this specific bacteria and has been shown to be quite effective. Um, she was given a 14-day supply of ciprofloxacin um, sent home with that. And 11 days into this treatment, she developed um, enthesopathy. Um, and the healthcare professionals decided that this was most likely due to um, this specific antibiotic, the ciprofloxacin. So they gave her doxycycline instead for the last three days of this 14-day antibiotic treatment. Um, and you may be asking, wow, that's a lot of antibiotics, um, a lot of different types of antibiotics. And this is because that in the beginning, the doctors weren't quite sure um, which bacteria was causing this infection. But uh, shortly thereafter, after three days um, of giving streptomycin and vancomycin, they found out it was tularensis. So they had to switch it up to make sure that this patient got the best possible treatment in terms of antibiotics to get her back to health. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit about F. tularensis. Um, this bacteria is transmitted often through infected animals um, by con contact with them, um, consumption of their meat, um, and arthropod bites such as deer ticks or other ticks, and also contact with water uh, that has this bacteria in it. And one of the animals that oftentimes carry this disease is uh, rabbits. So it has been coined the rabbit fever in some places. And in this map of our beautiful country, you can see that in the south central area of the US, there is a very large uh, concentration of blue dots. And that just shows that F. tularensis is uh, very common in that area. And, um, but 
being that we're in New England, um, we obviously care a lot about our region of the country. And so you can see where that uh, red circle is, that right by Massachusetts, there's also a high concentration of blue dots of tularensis cases. And this is uh, because there are a lot of um, tularemia cases from Martha's Vineyards, um, around 15 to 20 each year. And there's a really interesting backstory to this. And it is that in the early 20th century, there were rabbits that were from the South Central US that were imported into the island of Martha's Vineyards for gaming purposes. And with the rabbits, um, F. tularensis was also imported to this island. So to this day, um, this bacteria is very rampant and um, is very widespread on Martha's Vineyards and the tick and rabbit populations there. Uh, and so some of the symptoms of tularemia include separation of lymph nodes, abscesses, um, facial cellulitis, chronic otitis, uh, meningitis, acute encephalitis, and lymphangitis of the upper limb. Um, and so all of these, as you can see, are not very comfortable to have. Um, and so we definitely don't want to get tularemia. Um, and so some ways to prevent yourself from getting tularemia um, j includes just preventing yourself from getting tick bites, similar to preventing yourself from Lyme disease, um, which receives a lot more PR. So you can do this by wearing permethrin-treated clothing, um, wearing repellents, checking yourself for ticks, um, just trying to avoid these tick bites. Um, and by doing that, you can be a lot safer in the outdoors and hopefully not contract tularemia. Thank you. Um, so you meant like the, uh, Are you like, it was like off the or something like that. Yeah, there was a high oh, number yeah. of very low net rights. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't really find anything. It was not associated with ulcerol glandular turnia. They just saw it and then they got scared that it could be something else that they weren't familiar with before. The endocarditis could lead to another different form of tularemia, which is why they considered it. But it wasn't confirmed that it was endocarditis. So... <clears throat> I'll uh, just add to that a little bit. Uh, endocarditis uh, happens when there's bo both of those. Endocarditis and glomerular nephritis are, are signs of uh, systemic bacteria, where you have bacteria uh, in your bloodstream and a leakage pattern in different parts of the body. Uh, endocarditis happens often after oral surgery because uh, the, the normal oral flora uh, during the surgery gets introduced into the bloodstream. And then for whatever reason, that particular bacteria that lives in the, in the mouth likes to uh, become florid in the heart and it'll grow on uh, particularly the, the, the flaps of the atrioventricular valves and it makes those valves not able to work properly uh, and if not treated rapidly can lead to heart failure. But um, if you hear that, that heart murmur, it uh, raises the question of that. And the same with venereal nephritis. You have 20% you know, of your blood flow going through your kidneys at any one point in time, uh, and the nephrons are particularly susceptible to uh, bacteremia. So both of those are suggestive of systemic bac bacteremia, which is rare with this ulceral glandular tularemia because it's, uh, it's topical. It's, it's on the surface. It has to be a bad infection in order to get to go into bacteremia to go mm -hmm. systemic. Other forms of tularemia, like uh, pneumatic tularemia, that's when the person ha has presumably inhaled the uh, bacteria somehow by like friable feces or something like that from the, from the animal, um, or in by ingesting it or something like that with the infected meat. Uh, that's going to have a more direct route to bacteremia, and, and that's where you're going to see the endocarditis and the glomerular nephritis more commonly. This is an unusual case because the ulcer ulceral glandular uh, tularemia has not 
been a de correlated with these two things, but uh, it's just an indication of the severity of this woman's infection. Mm -hmm. She had a very severe uh, case of, of this, this type of tularemia. Um, so I, I had a couple questions. Uh, you had that diagram of the United States. It was such a cool diagram. I'm glad you found that, wherever you found that. Um, yeah, right there. Is that uh, just ulceroglandular tularemia, or is this all of the various manifestations? And what did you find in terms, did you find anything in terms of the, the um, like, the proportions, like how many people get ulceroglandular versus pneumatic, et cetera? That, that, just that was kind of interesting to me. Cool, yeah, so um, this was from the American Lyme Disease Foundation, but they did it on tularemia. Mm -hmm. um, and what I, when I was looking through it, it didn't say specifically ulceroglandular tularemia, yeah. so um, I think it's safe to say it's probably just all cases of tularemia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, did you find any information about the relative occurrence of the different manifestations? Um, no, I didn't. I was just trying to get a relative, like, where are these yeah, happening? Yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Sorry. Given that, like, it occurs in mammals, like rabbits and also in other mammals, I was wondering if you looked up anything about the bacteria in life cycles and kind of how it can interfere with the environment. Um, so in the, um, according to, what is this, Denver Health, uh, <laughs> there was, it really um, brought t this tick as the main vector um, of this disease from whatever infected animal, oftentimes rabbits, squirrels, um, some type of rodenty thing, um, and with ticks bringing it toward humans was the main cause. Yeah. All right, thank you.